we see power creep all over the place in all kinds of games where a new option is released that is more powerful than previously existing options and we absolutely see it in D&D and not just 5th edition but any edition where new options for players is released you're inevitably going to get some power creep sometimes power creep is intentional and it can even be malicious blizzard is known for this they're infamous for continually introducing deliberate and obvious power creep for no other reason than to keep players spending money to get the newest and best options. And sometimes it's not intentional. Let's say you design five new subclasses and you want them to be balanced and you make that one of your design goals. Well, are you perfect? If you're not, good chance some of those five are going to be more powerful than others. And unless you deliberately make them weak, some or even one of them might be the newest and most powerful subclass for that class and you've just created power creep or even if it isn't there might be a combination that you just didn't foresee like dread ambusher is a powerful feature on its own but when it says you take the attack action on your first turn into combat you get an additional weapon attack with the d8 damage bonus well if you have two levels in Fighter and use Action Surge on that first round of combat, you can trigger this twice, since you can take two attack actions on that first turn. Did the designers foresee that interaction? I doubt it. And so for those reasons, usually we call out Power Creep as something that can get out of control, it can make a game worse, and it can even wreck a game. I would say 3.5 was a D&D edition where Power Creep got so bad that eventually the game got to the point where you couldn't even really play in a game where some of the characters were optimized and others weren't. Because it wasn't just that the unoptimized characters were weaker, it was that they were so much weaker that they were essentially useless. Now, in my last video, linked at the top of your screen, I presented what I consider the worst examples of Power Creep in 5th edition. And although we aren't at a point yet where they're ruining D&D, they definitely, in my opinion, have made the game worse. However, I've only talked about two kinds of power creep. Deliberate malicious power creep to pressure us to spend more money and power creep by mistake, where unintentional power creep is introduced to the game. But there's a third kind of power creep and I see it quite a bit in 5th edition, where clearly the power creep is deliberate, but it addresses current issues in the game, sometimes impressively well, and that's the power creep I'm going to talk about today. Power creep that in my opinion makes D&D a better game. And we're going to start with Xanathar's Guide to Everything, a book that has some bad examples of power creep, but it also has some power creep that designers definitely knew was power creep, but the kind of power creep that almost indisputably makes D&D better. I'm going to start with what I think is a very strong example, tool proficiencies. So everything in this pretty chunky section makes player characters more powerful. Characters get advantage if they can use a tool they're proficient with as part of an ability check using a skill. Every tool set is given examples of ways it can be used to provide this advantage. For example, proficiency in Carpenter's tools allows them to be used in conjunction with an investigation check when you're inspecting areas within wooden structures because you know the methods of construction used to conceal areas from discovery. It makes sense, and it's cool, and it makes Carpenter's tools more interesting, and yes, makes your character more powerful. And tools were also given new features. Like, did you know you could use a DC-20 glass blower's tools check to determine what a glass object once held? Well, you can, at least ever since Xanathar's. And so what this whole section does, in addition to making your character with tools more powerful, is they make tools more interesting and more fun, and D&D is better for them. And here's another example, simultaneous effects. So sometimes things in D&D happen simultaneously, but mechanically you need to determine what order the effects are applied. And sometimes the order doesn't really matter. And sometimes it does. Now, before Xanathar's, the DM would have to decide. So in Xanathar's, the designer said, okay, the DM can decide, but if it's the player character's turn, well, in that case, the player can decide. So if your character makes some kind of attack that maybe has two force movement effects, like maybe you hit something with an Eldritch Blast and it has both Repelling Blast and Grasp of Vidar, then it's the player that gets to choose if the creature is pushed first or pulled first. 
And this order can make quite a difference if the target is close to some harmful effect, for example. It gives the player character more power by choosing this order. But it also opens up a lot of fun combinations that make D&D combat more interesting. And of course, we're going to have to talk about Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. This book is absolutely full of power creep. And I pointed out some examples that I thought made the game worse in my last video. But now I'm going to point out some that I think make the game better. So, in the Player's Handbook, it says, If you play a Wood Elf, you get a Dexterity bonus of plus 2 and a Wisdom bonus of plus 1. So that can work pretty well if you're making, say, an archery-based character, or a cleric, or a druid, or a finesse weapon-based character, or a monk. Doesn't work so great if you want to make a wizard, or a barbarian, or a paladin, though. So if the character you want to play is a wood elf paladin, well, you're going to get mechanically punished for that combination. And so you could pick any of the classes, and there was kind of a set list of so-called right choices for the race. And the list wouldn't be that long, so you saw the same race and class combinations over and over and over, until Tasha's provided a rule that allowed players to switch those scores around. You want to play a Wood Elf Paladin? Sure, why not? Just put that plus one in Strength and plus two in Charisma. Now that's a totally viable race and class combination. Ever since this book, the whole thing where a class had this limited list of viable race options, it's been gone. Making characters more powerful? Yes, deliberately. And in my opinion, it's good for the game. And speaking of customizing your origin, proficiency and language swaps. Because something else that just makes Wood Elf and Paladin feel bad is that Wood Elf is giving you these elf weapon training proficiencies where you get proficiency in the short sword, long sword, short bow, and long bow. And that's great, except the Paladin gets proficiency in all those weapons anyways. So too bad, you just got a trait that's pointless. So this rule allows you to swap those proficiencies for something else that you don't have. So instead of a proficiency in longsword as a racial trait, maybe I give my Wood Elf Leatherworker's Tools proficiency instead so I can make a custom saddle for my found steed. Great. It's not a huge boost in power, but it is definitely power creep, and I think the game is better for it. Now, with modern player race design, all these rules are not needed anymore, as they're all designed in such a way to not have these incompatibilities and redundancies. But for player's handbook races, these are the rules that keep them relevant. And for classes, we got optional class features. So for example, a druid could now use one of their wild shape uses to cast Find Familiar, and a rogue could use their bonus action to make an attack with advantage. And the ranger, well, not only did they get straight out new features like adding a spell focus as an option for spell casting and a built-in ability to change their fighting style, but the player's handbook ranger is filled with feel bad features. And you get new options for every single one of them that are better designed and actually useful. It is a big buff to the ranger, but unlike the gloom stalker, these kinds of buffs correct things that weren't working rather than just piling a bunch of new powerful stuff on top of the stuff that doesn't work well. This is power creep done right, in my opinion. Oh, and there are lots of optional class features in Tasha's, and all of them are power creep, and I think the game is better for them. I personally use all of them in my games, and I've never regretted it. Now, we should talk about subclasses because it is no secret that a number of subclasses in Tasha's introduce significant power creep to the game, and I gave a couple examples in my last video where I think that power creep did harm. But here's a few examples where I welcome the power creep. So Mercy Monk is the best monk subclass, and you know what? Great. The monk needed a better subclass option. In fact, both of the subclasses presented here were originally going to be introducing power creep to the monk, but due to negative response from the D&D community, Astral Self was scaled back to where it's not really a good subclass anymore, and that's too bad. I would have loved for monks to have two good subclass options instead of just one, but I'll take one over zero. Here's a couple of subclasses, though, that introduce what I think is very nice power creep, Fathomless and Genie Patron Warlocks. So what is so smart here is, unlike Hexblade, they don't completely front load the power creep, so a class that is infamous for two level dips gets all that power right up front. But the big features here, like Grasping Tentacles, an Elemental Gift, they come later, meaning the player's actually rewarded for sticking with Warlock. And that is the kind of power creep I can get behind. 
and it was smart of the designers to lay out these subclasses this way. And this one might be controversial, but Aberrant Mind and Clockwork Soul Bloodlines are, I mean, they're pretty obviously huge examples of power creep. I don't think anyone's going to debate that. Easily, the biggest pain point of playing a sorcerer before these subclasses is that sorcerers get an extremely low number of spells known. Players who started with D&D more recently may not know this, but it wasn't just the ranger that D&D players complained was too weak before Tasha's. They complained sorcerers were too weak as well. Now, I didn't personally necessarily agree. I mean, the Sorcerer has a fairly good spell list. It's a full caster, and metamagic is good. But I did understand the frustration. I mean, naturally, you're going to compare Sorcerers to Wizards, not Barbarians. Of course you are. I mean, the Sorcerer spell list is mostly the Wizard spell list that's been trimmed down significantly. So, it's worse. Quite a bit worse. Even though, compared to other casters, it looks fine. So add that together with the few number of known spells and, frankly, lackluster subclasses, and even though I didn't think sorcerers were necessarily weak compared to other classes that don't rhyme with blizzard, compared to wizards, they were weak. So we have two subclasses here that directly address the pain points. Psionic spells and clockwork spells do two things. They give the sorcerer way more spells known, and they give the Sorcerer access to more spells that aren't on the Sorcerer list, including some that aren't on the Wizard list either, by the way. And I did a couple videos where I did a very detailed deep dive to determine if the addition of these subclasses made it so that the Sorcerer was more powerful than the Wizard. And what I determined is, probably isn't, but it is really close now. And frankly, I think that's okay. If these subclasses made Sorcerers the new most powerful class in the game, then I think they went too far. But sorcerers that are as good as wizards and don't have the pain points, I mean, that I can get behind. Now what we need are the player's handbook subclasses to be redesigned to be more attractive. And I guess we'll have to see how everything shakes out in the new player's handbook. But yeah, love them or hate them, these two new subclasses are some big power creep, and personally, I kind of love them. Now, let's say you have a character with an odd ability score so a half feet giving you a plus one in that ability score would fit really nicely with your next ability score increase well there's not very many good options in the player's handbook but tasha's gave us a lot of really nice half feats i mean there's crusher slasher fey touched telekinetic skill expert pick the ability score you want to increase and you can find a solid half feat for that ability score in this book. And it is definitely power creep, but it fills a gap that I could really feel before this book. Fizzman's Treasury of Dragons has one example of power creep I think was really good for the game. The idea of Dragonborn as a race I think is cool. The realization of Dragonborn as a race in the player's handbook missed the mark. So Fizzman's gave us three Dragonborn variants, and they're all straight up better than the player's handbook version. And good. I actually play Dragonborn sometimes now, and yes, of course, I'm playing these variants. Now, I will say the balance here is not perfect, as Gem Dragonborn are likely more powerful than the other two options, and this would have been even better if they had gotten that balance right. But still, Dragonborn in D&D as actually a decent option, I think that's good for the game. So let's go more recent now with Glory of the Giants. We get a new Barbarian subclass called the Path of the Giant. And it is definitely power creep, as it is the most powerful Barbarian subclass in the game right now. And you know what? Good. The Barbarian needed a subclass that was a big brute that could throw people around, that actually hits really hard, and is good at throwing weapons. And yes, that's more powerful. Now the unfortunate thing is that we now have one subclass that's better than all the others. But, like with Mercy Monk, I'll still take it and just hope for more in the future. I mean, it looks like we might get a couple more great Barbarian subclasses in the updated Player's Handbook. I mean, if the playtest versions of Berserker and Wildtree go ahead as presented, I guess we'll see. So yeah, Power Creep is gonna happen. And yes, when the new core books comes out, we're gonna get even more. And let's keep it real, it's probably gonna help them sell more books. But I think Power Creep can be fine, and even good. And with the examples I present in this video, I tend to see the same thing over and over. First, it looks to me to be deliberate. And second, it serves a purpose beyond just making characters more powerful. 
They flesh out new options that expand the game. They fill gaps that were obviously there. They address pain points in the game that we have let the designers know exist, and the designers respond by providing us a solution through power creep. And that's just fine by me. And so that's what I think makes some power creep good and some actual examples of it in 5th edition D&D. So now, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody, and I'll talk to you soon.